So good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. If you could just take your seats. Uh, my name is Lionel Barber. I'm the editor of the Financial Times. I'm here to chair this discussion. We have four distinguished political leaders from Europe uh, who will be talking about resilient dynamism in Europe, European economy, and the Eurozone. I'm going to start with Prime Minister Mario Monti. Uh, and if you look at this panel, we have a real rich tapestry. We have big countries. We have smaller countries. I did not say small. We have debtor countries, and we have creditor countries. We have countries in the Eurozone and outside the Eurozone. So they're all going to offer their own distinct national perspective in a European dimension. So, Prime Minister Monti, um, I think it was the Financial Times that a year ago said that two people needed to save Europe and the Eurozone. They both were called Mario. Do tell us, last year we felt as though Europe and the Eurozone was on the edge. This year, some confidence has come back, but the big story is, where's the growth going to come from? So it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on how you see what you've accomplished over the last year as Prime Minister and what you see in the year ahead, including those elections. Yes, there are elections, I understand, uh, in uh, at least two large European countries this year. Um, well, what uh, uh, are we doing to achieve growth? I think each of us has to do things domestically. And concerning Italy, what uh, we have been doing uh, uh, in spite or maybe helped by the pressures of financial emergency has been to um, begin injecting more competition and openness in the markets. This uh, is something that is totally in line with uh, the EU inspiration of a social market economy. And uh, we did that by, first of all, securing the sustainability of public finances in the long term, including uh, a tough um, pension reform, and also uh, looking at the factors for growth. Um, infrastructures long delayed in Italy. We have simplified the process of building infrastructures and injected an acceleration of those. Um, then the functioning of the markets, and uh, we have introduced more competition. For example, in the liberal professions, who like to call themselves liberal, but uh, need many pushes to become liberal. And uh, in the uh, separation between gas uh, production and gas distribution, to give you another example. Or in the shopping hours and the commerce sector. Uh, also, uh, a lot of simplification concerning public administration and, uh, uh, and bureaucracy. Uh, of course, this needs to be continued. And uh, one issue about the Italian elections, uh, in which I, would, I will not go uh, unless requested here today, is which political configuration is more in line with the need to sustain these structural reforms. But I believe that uh, no individual country in Europe, not even the largest ones, can really keep a momentum for growth or resume a momentum for growth unless the EU policies are more oriented towards growth. And much of the time and energy in this year of Italian government has been devoted precisely to that. Uh, and uh, we have been among uh, the pushing factors at the table of the European Council concerning the adoption of a pact for growth, uh, and also with the daily insistence on the single market being taken more seriously. We all know that Europe is based on the single market, but you, we also know, as Prime Minister Cameron, I heard just say, 
that there isn't really a single market for energy, for many of the services, for the digital services in Europe. And finally, we insist with some success in the recent European Councils to have a more forward-looking understanding in Europe of the role of good public investment, particularly for the interconnections, for the infrastructure investment. And uh, this is something that we should also take into account in our view when we move in a couple of weeks to, I hope, the final negotiations on the EU seven-year budget. We all have an interest in saving, in containing public spending at the national and the EU level. Italy is the third largest net contributor. We certainly have an interest in that. But I think it's against uh, common sense, economics and history not to see the potential for economies of scale of a EU budget slightly less restrained than we are forced and willing to restrain our national budgets. Thank you, Prime Minister. Prime Minister Kenny, um, Ireland has been through the equivalent of a hurricane since the onset of the global financial crisis. And yet, in the last 12 months, Ireland has come back to the capital markets. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the structural economic reforms that you've been taking in Ireland, and particularly perhaps to repair the banking system, which after all is, is, is the sine qua non for resumption of growth? Yes, well, it's been a hurricane. Um, two years ago, when the administration or government I lead was elected, We'd actually lost 250,000 jobs in the private sector in the three years prior to that. Our reputation was in shreds around the world. Our banks were dysfunctional. They couldn't approach any market. And there was a complete sense of hopelessness and despair and disillusionment. Now, government was elected with a, with a very clear mandate to sort this out, to deal with our public financial problems, to make the changes in the structures in Ireland that would lead us to being able to prove that when you have a strategy and a plan and that you follow it, you'll see results. And two years on, interest rates are down from 14% to 4 Our banks have been recapitalized, restructured, have been back in the markets without a state guarantee as um, tentative signs of being able to exit this program in 2013. We have over 1,000 multinationals still driving exports in double-digit figures. But our people have had to take really serious challenges because government made really serious decisions. And it's an example for Europe and for anywhere else that if a government actually works with its people and in understanding the patience of people and putting up with these changes, that in the greater, in the greater picture of things, um, results will flow. Now, we expect to exit our program in 2013. But we cannot do it without the cooperation of what's been committed to from our European colleagues. And we hope to do that in 2013 as an example of what a success can be for a smaller country, as you say, as part of the bigger European Union issue. And I would like to say that it's important in terms of international reputation for, for contributor countries to be able to understand that their money here is not wasted, that there's an example of a country having measured up now to the seven analysis by the Troika and having exceeded all of those targets, that the finishing part of that particular difficulty is the promissory notes issue and the following through on the decision of the 29th of June to break the link between sovereign debt and bank debt moving on to the supervisory mechanism and banking union. Because for a smaller country, as you say, the mechanisms and the tools that are available now were not available when the crash hit Ireland. And we were required to borrow 64 billion, or 40% of our GDP, to pay for banks and private creditors to banks in a situation which has been a crushing burden on the people. 
So their patience has been long and they've been waiting. And markets have actually factored in a conclusion to this situation for Ireland. So we hope that that can be so. Now, I would like to say that as um, uh, in the middle of all that, Lionel, in the middle of all that, we, we were required by our constitution to have a referendum of the people on the Fiscal Stability Treaty. And Ireland voted 60-40 in favour of the euro and in favour of maintaining our central contact with Europe and the eurozone because that's where we see our future. And that's why in this presidency, we want to run this effectively in the interests of all the countries as an honest broker for Europe. And that's why I'd like to see the issues of um, trade, the digital single market, Japan, Singapore, Canada, the opening of negotiations with the United States following the high level report. I think these are real opportunities. Politics for, for, for all of us here who are, who are leaders is essentially about people. We've got 26 million people unemployed in the European Union. Yeah. There are millions of young people who do not see their careers or their opportunities being rewarded by the decisions made by politicians. And that's a central issue, that people have to see leaders follow through on the decisions that are made. And that's an issue always with Europe. When you make decisions at the European Council, see that they're followed through in the interests of all the citizens. So I hope that we can conclude an MFF for the, for the seven years. I hope that during this presidency, we can then go to the parliament and discuss that with them right. because they're required from Lisbon to give their consent and authorization and then move to CAP reform and the 70 legislative files that are necessary to be put through. Very good. So we um, have that future. We must follow through on the decisions right. and make them happen. That's what politics is about. Thank you very much for that. Um, just one clarification. Would you, uh, you rightly said that it's, it's an uh, incredible result to get 60-40 in favor of the Fiscal Stability Pact, given what Ireland's gone through. Um, so you clearly know how to win a referendum. Would you like to give Mr. Cameron some advice on that? Well, I put it this way. We've had referendums over the, over the last 40 years. We've, uh, we've been We've been married to Europe for 40 years now, and I'm very proud of that fact. We've had all those referendums, Lisbon, Nice, Amsterdam, Maastricht. People in our country understand the difference between the Council, the Commission, and the Parliament. They understand structural funds, cohesion funds, social funds, the CAP, all of these things. We have made our decision linked clearly to the future of the, of the Eurozone and Europe. But we're also the closest... Uh, partner to Britain. We have strategic partnerships signed with Britain. They're our biggest trading partner. Obviously, there's a great contact for, for a very long time there. I don't speak for the British government here, but it is true to say that Britain were a driving force for the single market, that the European Union will continue to be much stronger because Britain can remain a part of that. But I would, I would argue that many of the issues that arise for politicians sort of from a bureaucracy point of view or from an administration point of view. These are things that you can change from inside. That's why I would like to see the digital market become truly single uh, with that opportunity. And we can do that collectively with the energy of the union. Right. So I don't speak, obviously, for the British government. Uh, but whatever happens, I would like to see that Britain would remain central uh, to the European Union and for its future. It's very important in a global sense where most of the big opportunities will arise outside the European Union in the next uh, 20 years. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Toing Schmidt, uh, it would be very interesting, I think, for this audience to hear about your government's reform program. You obviously run a minority government, uh, so that presents challenges. It's also a coalition government. Uh, we're just getting used to that in the UK. Uh, but above all, I'm, I'm interested in to the, the degree to which you have a margin of maneuver as a smaller country within this big block. To speak, yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, I think this whole crisis that we have been through, and we're not through it yet, there are still uh, an enormous amount of people suffering in this uh, crisis. Everyone has spoken about the young people who are unemployed and unable to make a living. Uh, so we're not through the crisis yet. But it has been a wake-up call for all of us. And this wake-up call should be used um, 
in a good way, so that the last years we've been through will not be lost, but will be a useful uh, way of taking us uh, through to the other side. And uh, this is what we've been learning at the European level, that we need to reform in order to maintain the Europe that we want. We woke up uh, when we had the crisis, realizing that we lost our competitive edge, that our welfare state was too um, unmanageable, uh, that we had uh, lost what we thought was so good about Europe. And what we need to do in the coming years is to restore all that. We need to change, and we need to change in a structural way to maintain what we like so much about Europe. And what at the same time keeping very clear in our heads what makes Europe special. What makes Europe special is that we have a social market economy, that we have focused on environment, climate issues, and where we all also try to make a good business out of that. And of course, our democracy, our human rights, our equality, and all the other things that make Europe special. And what we need to do the coming years is to change, but still keeping what we feel is our core values. This is exactly the same as uh, I have tried to do uh, back home as Prime Minister uh, in Denmark. We have done three things. First of all, we have kept an extremely tight budget. We have adopted a budget uh, legislation. We can no, no longer exceed our budget from year to year. We are running a very tight budget. And believe me, it's not easy to run a tight budget, but it's necessary. All this has meant we have a very low interest rate in Denmark. We have become a safe haven in these uh, difficult times. So a tight budget is extremely important. The second thing we have done is to be on a reform frenzy. We have reformed so much the last year uh, that I don't think it has any comparison in our history. We have reformed the tax system, early retirement. Um, we, have reform we are now reforming the benefit system. We are trying to reform the schooling system. Um, so we have been on a big, and, and this is not all, we have been on a big reform frenzy over the last year because this is necessary in order to preserve the well-developed welfare state that we want, want to have in, in my country. And the third thing, and I think this is very important for the individual me member states, but for Europe as a whole as well. We have tried to bring balance into our budget, but at the same time having a, a focus on uh, the groups in our society who are most vulnerable. What does that mean? That means that every year when we had made the budget, we have made sure that the most vulnerable citizens, be it vulnerable children in a vulnerable position, be it the poorest pensioners, have got something out of our budget. So we have tried to preserve equality, which is also part of not only Danish values, but European values as such. So the three things, tight budget control, reforms, also quite harsh reforms, uh, some um, will think, and also being focused on getting all over to the other side and preserving what we feel is so important for us, equality. This is part of what we need to do at the European level as well. And um, I think we have so much to offer in the European Union. So whilst we go through the change we need to go through, and we need to stay awake now, after this wake-up call, we also need to focus what is our core values, what is the great thing about Europe, and preserve that while we are changing. This is uh, true for Europe, and it's true for the individual countries in Europe. Now, that's a, a very powerful statement of the reform program. Just to clarify, uh, do you think, though, you'd be better off and be able to do even more in that Eurozone club, or do you think you're better outside? Well, we have always, uh, I've always been in favor of Denmark joining the Euro, and I still am. And the interesting thing about the development uh, in, in Europe that over the last two years is that we have had different choices. We had to have a choice between splitting up or staying solidaric with each other. We chose the solidarity path, which is a very good thing. 
Within that path, we also had the choice between should the Euro countries be stronger together and exclude the non-Euro countries, or should we try to meet and bridge the divide between non-Euro and Euro countries? Again, we chose the bridge. And one thing I'm extremely happy about is that every time we have taken a decision about strengthening the Euro, be it the fiscal compact, be it the lending mechanisms, all these things, the Euro countries have chosen a policy of the open door, a policy where it's always mm. Euro plus, which means that countries like my own, Denmark and other countries, Sweden, Poland, other countries, some of the Baltic countries, we always know that even though we have two different paces, and of course we have two different paces, there's an open door for non-Euro countries to join in, that, uh, in those decisions. Examples, the fiscal compact was open to non-Euro countries, which meant that I think Denmark was the first to join the fiscal compact, even though we are non-Euro country. Now we're discussing uh, a banking union. The discussion is sort of, has the starting point that it's a Euro plus uh, it's a Euro Plus initiative, which means that we will have a, a vivid debate in my country whether we will join this banking union, but the point is it's open to non-Euro country. That has been some of the most important decisions we have taken the last two years, that we have not split, we have stuck together, and there's, a, there's always a Euro Plus uh, way of seeing this, whichever initiative that has been taken. Good. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Rutter, uh, you've just been through elections. Uh, you did better than expected, your party. You also represent a creditor country. Um, my question is twofold. Um, one, tell us a little bit about the Dutch reform program, what it's seeking to accomplish. And second, whether you agree that whereas in 2012, there was a question mark about whether the club would lose some members or a member. In fact, now that's a settled question and that all countries have agreed, including a particularly large one, that the club will remain intact. Well, let me start with answering your second question by uh, uh, applauding my colleagues from Italy and Ireland. Uh, they decided in a very difficult phase to take the helm in their countries. They are both now prime ministers in the most difficult of circumstances. And I think this is fantastic. And, and both Mario and Enda have done a lot of good stuff now in their countries to implement reforms, get the fiscal discipline which is necessary, get the public finances in order. And this is to answer your second question. I believe our aim should be to have the whole Eurozone intact and to keep all the countries as members of the Eurozone. At the same time, you can never predict whether at one stage a country would want to leave the Eurozone. And I think that should be possible. But the policy my government has, and I think all of our, of the group of 17 has at the moment, is to keep the Eurozone intact. Then to move to the Netherlands, we are running the tight ship Ella is mentioning in terms of uh, the public finances. Uh, we have to tighten the budget. We are doing this. At the same time, we are putting in place the necessary reforms in terms of the labor market, social security, pensions. But we also want to focus on, on growth. We, we, have, we, we, we need to, to, to get the, uh, the economic engine going. And therefore, we have brought together, in the best Dutch traditions, all the major players. The universities, the knowledge institutions, secondly, the government, obviously, the private sector, which is here of paramount importance, and the non-governmental organizations. And at every level, we're working together to get the growth engine going again in the Netherlands. And this has led to focusing on the main sectors in our economy, which we believe uh, will bring us exceptional growth in the future, like water management, like the agricultural sector. We are the second largest uh, uh, exporter of ag agricultural products in the world. But also on other issues like ICT and our financial, uh, financial sector, which is uh, considerably uh, big uh, uh, compared to the overall GDP of the Netherlands. So we focus very much our innovation money, our research money, our education efforts on these main sectors of, uh, of the economy. And then to Mario's point, 
uh, he has written this fantastic report on the internal market. If we would implement everything we have previously agreed in terms of the internal market, we could add 4% extra of GDP over the next 10 years. If we would finally be able to close a foreign trade agreement with Japan, with the United States, we could add another 2% of GDP over the next 10 years. These are enormous figures. And if somebody asks me how to explain um, the impact of being a member of the European Union, it is first and foremost being a member of the common market and the fact that it brings us jobs and prosperity. And sometimes I, I, I can be extremely frustrated, as I know most of my colleagues are, that the debates in the Eurozone group, in the Eurozone heads of state and government meetings, in the meetings of the European Council of the 27, are so much focused on all the troubles we have. And, and we should spend more time now and move to spend more time on these issues of getting growth going. And therefore, we need countries like Denmark, Sweden, United Kingdom. David has announced his famous referendum yesterday. We need these countries to stay not only in the European Union, but to be very active because Denmark, Sweden, United Kingdom, the countries in, 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 in the Baltics and some of the other Eastern European countries, they are very much focused on, on bolstering economic prosperity. And that is a different type of debate from what we are having at this moment within the Eurozone. So I'm always trying to, to liaise as much as possible with the non-Eurozone uh, countries. And obviously, it would be great if, they, if more of them would join. But if not, at least that they are a full part of, of what we are doing together, because we need that, that inspiration. And just picking up on your point about free trade areas, what, what odds do you think there are, 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10, about concluding a transatlantic free trade area uh, in 2013-14? I think the, the, the chances are, are positive. We, we, I think it is possible to, to come to an agreement now that Obama has been re-elected. I feel, personally, speaking to the members of the US administration and to uh, Barack Obama himself, that they understand, yes, they are focusing on Asia. But to be effective in this relationship between the United States and Asia, they have to work very well together with, uh, with Europe. Because the Europe and the US is a very strong uh, partnership. And uh, it, it's crazy that we are discussing a foreign, an, an, a foreign trade agreement with the US. Yes. And this would, transatlantic would, would thing. We should have this years ago. Years share, ago. share that view before I open it up to the floor for discussion and questions. Do you, uh, Prime Minister Monti, do you also believe that it is possible, finally, to secure an agreement with, between the 27 and the United States on a transatlantic free trade area? I think it is crucial. I think it is possible. I think it will require important adjustments in policies on both sides of the Atlantic, but I think it will eventually be done in the time span that you outline. Even with agriculture? An observation on, uh, no, uh, that would be one of the adjustments needed, but even with agriculture, yes. May I make an observation arising from what Mark said here? I actually feel that there's a, a, a new sense of realism about Europe, within Europe, because uh, two years ago the discussion was the breakup of the euro, exit from the, exit from the eurozone, uh, all of these difficulties. And all of the cynics uh, who knew all the answers said you'd never have an EFSM, you'd never have an EFSF, you'd never have any uh, permanent bailout mechanism, uh, that you'd never get to a point where you'd make a decision to break the link between sovereign and bank debt. And for the first time, actually, the Eurogroup and the, Euro, the, the ministers for finance were able to come in on time with a recommendation for the single supervisory mechanism endorsed by the European Council and now moving on to the, uh, to the discussions about the mechanics of that. Uh, just as, a, as, a, as the honest broker, as the presidency, when we didn't support the financial transaction tax because of the implications for London and Dublin being so close. And yet at the first meeting of the Eurogroup, it was the first item on the agenda, dealt within 15 minutes without a vote, uh, uh, so that countries that supported this could get on with that mechanism. Now, I, I think that what we need now during this current time is the mandate to start the negotiations for free trade between EU and the US. That will not be concluded this year and probably not next year. But I think it would be a big signal, a big signal, that, that the greatest trading bloc on earth, which is the European Union, and the United States at the start of a new administration, will be able to set out the roadmap by how this can happen. 
I believe the US is going to recover. I believe they will deal with a fiscal cliff. I'm concerned about Europe's lack of momentum in terms of having our own energy grid because the US will now become you know, um, an exporter of energy with the, with the changes that have happened there, which means that costs are rising in Europe in terms of major infrastructure from an energy perspective. We need uh, much more focus ourselves. At the end of the day, it's always about jobs, jobs, and jobs, and that means injecting growth into the European economies and making political decisions that will result in jobs being created for millions of young people across this union and give them hope and inspiration and motivation that politics actually does work. I believe in that. And I think if we get this mandate to start these discussions, Europe will certainly respond very positively and share Mario's and Hella's and, and Mark's view on this. Well, there's no doubt that one of the things we should be doing, and we worked for that uh, when we had the presidency, uh, is to pick the low-hanging fruits. And they are out there. We should complete the single market, the digital single market. We should finalize these trade agreements. We are very hopeful that you can also bring, uh, bring, bring, bring us a few steps ahead uh, in this context. This is what we should be doing. And at this, one of the directors we were extremely eager to finalize when we had the presidency was our energy efficiency directive. Why is that important? That is, because, that is important because energy efficiency means that we can be cutting edge in terms of using our energy much better and more efficient. If we can be cutting edge in Europe in terms of this, we can also make a good business out of that. So I think we need to focus on the low-hanging fruit, which is completing the single market, having these trade agreements, but also realizing where are we front runners in Europe and why should that not become a burden for us, but rather the opposite so we use it as something that sets us apart and, and give, gives us a competitive advantage in uh, the global uh, competitiveness. So this is what we should be focusing on and this is a very practical approach. We have four uh, heads and states of government sitting here. This is what we want to achieve and the pers perspective is enormous. Mark was quoting the figures, but the perspective for getting jobs and growth in, in Europe is an enormous, and that's why we need to, to move on these very practical issues right now. Just one last question for Prime Minister Monti, because this is a, a very going to be a very important issue in the campaign, and it is is, an issue throughout Europe, which is this question of unemployment. I mean, if there were two things you are doing or you would do if you continued in power to tackle this crisis in unemployment in Italy. There are other countries. I was in Spain just uh, two weeks ago talking to the Prime Minister Rajoy on this. What, what would you single out to offer some hope to those young people who don't have jobs? Two things. One is uh, specific me measures for youth. Um, and uh, that uh, uh, even this uh, outgoing government, for all its financial stringency, was able to begin awarding some tax relief for companies uh, hiring uh, uh, youth. But much more can be done in a five years perspective and with a now much more solid uh, public finance situation. And secondly, the overall or, uh, labor market reform. There we did introduce a labor market reform to inject more flexibility in the labor market. That did not go far enough. Why did it not go far enough? Because uh, one of the uh, unions uh, was considerably resisting to change and we need to change that culture. That is why, uh, and by the way, they, um, although they were invited to join like all the others, they also resisted a recent agreement on uh, productivity towards more decentralization in uh, uh, labor negotiations. So uh, the, uh, the idea uh, that uh, uh, I would uh, uh, promote, should I be in a position to do so, is definitely to unite those reformist, pro-reform forces that have been dispersed across the political spectrum 
so that there is more energy behind the reforms, including in the labour market. Just like at the other end of the political spectrum in Italy, uh, there, there has been one party, the right-wing party, that has resisted uh, deeper reforms in the area of law, of anti-corruption, for example, of conflict of interest. We have done something, but uh, we need, again, by uniting these pro-reform forces to do uh, more. All this will bring new life to the Italian economy, and the first ones to benefit will be the, the youth and the unemployed youth. Thank you very much. Now we're going to uh, take questions from the floor. I think I'm going to, because uh, we're going to take two, two. So there's a gentleman. I can't see whether it's a lady or a gentleman. Uh, yeah. Definitely okay. a gentleman. Not a statement, a no, question. No, okay. Roland Rudd, RLM Finsbury. Uh, the UK Prime Minister talked about repatriating powers from Brussels back to the UK. Uh, what chances do you think he has for success? And are there any powers that the Prime Ministers on the panel would like to repatriate from Brussels to their own countries? Yep, okay. Repatriation, the big question. And then there's a gentleman there. Davide Serra, the intergenerational taxation the governments over the last few years have uh, put on the new generation by basically running deficit and now having new guys with no jobs or pension, is there a way to have a social contract, take away something that was given to the old, that was not sustainable, in order to kickstart employment in the youth before it becomes a social tension. Thank you very much for that. I think we'll quickly take repatriation, if, if you don't mind, because if we had all four, we, we won't get through questions. So perhaps um, Prime Minister Rutter and Prime Minister Kenny could take the repatriation question, and then we'll go for intergenerational from Prime Minister Monti and Prime Minister Toring Schmidt. So Prime Minister Kenny, do you want to talk about repatriation and what are the possibilities <laughs> and would you like to repatriate some powers? Well, it's, it, Prime Minister Cummins made his speech, uh, made his contribution here about what he would like to see. I think there's a, there's a measure here uh, of what it is that Europe wants to do in the time ahead. Now, there is no opportunity now for reopening nego negotiations about treaty changes. Uh, my priority, and I think the priority of, of Europe now, should be to deal with the consequences of our current crisis. And just because there is no talk now of uh, the euro failing or countries leaving the euro uh, doesn't mean that there is, should be any complacency. The opposite actually is the effect that Europe should now drive on with making its decisions uh, about improving the issues that we've spoken about here with uh, impact on employment. It may well be uh, that when we go down the road of the single supervisory mechanism, uh, banking union, uh, greater um, um, integration in terms of, um, of uh, financial managements and so on, and there'll be consideration for a future treaty change. Uh, that's probably after the, the next uh, parliament and the next commission. So I feel that, um, that Europe's new priority of, of understanding that it's lagged behind and that it can do so much better can mean that the collective energy can deal with many of the obstacles that are there to trade and uh, job creation. Whoever sits on this platform in 10 years' time will live in a very different world. The internet, genetics, biotech, nanotechnology, nanomedicine, robotics are changing the world as, as, we, as we sit here. And it is the countries that can, that, can, um, that can deal with riding those waves before they actually happen that are going to make the big impact. And I think Europe's research, innovation, education facilities right. will allow us to do that. I'm not concerned now about repatriation of powers. I'm much more concerned about leading on from where we find ourselves to, uh, to a brighter and a, a more prosperous future. We can talk about all of these issues in the context of yeah. future treaty change, if and when that arises. Yeah, you, you might say, actually, I'm quite all right, Jack, because the last thing we want is free rewriting treaties or, or changing, for example, the flexibility on your tax system. 
Well, our taxes are very clear here. Our tax is 12.5% uh, corporate tax rate. It's 11.9% effective. It's transparent across the entire spectrum. I know that the, the, uh, the tax regime in Europe in general may lead companies to, do, to, 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 uh, to uh, make decisions about their tax rates. But Ireland's not a tax, uh, a, a, you know, a, a haven for unorthodox practice in respect of tax. It's very clear, it's very transparent, yes. and it applies right across the board. Yeah. Um, and it's the regime uh, generally that may be used by uh, by companies. But our tax regime is a national competence, and it's not changing. Yeah, got you. Well, precisely, precisely because. Europe is changing and the world is changing. We need to have this debate on subsidiarity. Which tasks should be dealt with at the European level and which tasks should be dealt with at the national level? Uh, I think this should be a debate with the 27. To, and this is a permanent debate. And for example, issues personally, I would, have, I would like to have an argument with my colleagues on why in the area of occupational health and safety, there is so much which has been dealt with at the European level. It's a bit like, in, in terms of, of rules and legislation, it's a bit like Hotel California. Eh? You, can, you can check out, but you can never leave. You can never repatriate tasks to the national level. My, I do not agree when somebody would ask for specific opt-outs for just one country. I think that is not good. I think the end of the debate should be a settlement at the level of the 27, and it could be tasked from the national level to the European level, from the European level back to the national level. I also very much agreed with David, David's comments yesterday in terms of making the European Union more efficient. And uh, to make it more relevant, we should also look at the running costs of the Union. And particularly, I liked his parts where he spoke about competitiveness, getting the engine going, getting more jobs in Europe and doing much more in those areas. And at the end of the day, I think it is vital for us as a European Union and for the United Kingdom to, be, to stay part of the European Union. The United Kingdom outside the European Union would be an island somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean between the United States and Europe. It would not, not be connected with any of these two. So I think it is vital for all of us that they stay in. Fine. Yes. Fine. Well, on, on still on repatriation, just a word, if I may. Uh, I think it's very important to have a pragmatic attitude here. Through the history of European integration, some subject matters may have to go up in terms of decision-making, centralizations. Other can come down. Uh, in one area on which I worked, competition policy, uh, some years ago, a big reform was introduced whereby many competences previously dealt with only by Brussels have been given to the national competition authorities, whereas full competence to deal with macro competition cases, transatlantic cases, etc., has been further concentrated in Brussels. So pragmatism, which should be a British attitude of mind, on, uh, uh, on future generations, but, but without much ideology, if possible, uh, on, on, future, oh, okay. on, uh, on uh, future generations and taxation in a broad sense, I think two things are key. One, sustainability of pension systems in order not to penalize future generations. And secondly, uh, fiscal discipline in order, again, not to penalize future generations. And I often make the case in Italy that much of the difficulties for Italian young people to find a job now is due to the fiscal indiscipline of 20 or 30 years ago, before there were European constraints, that brought the politician of that time to disregard the future of uh, uh, Italians. Uh, from this point of view, I would only see one uh, improvement because we practice a pretty rough fiscal discipline, we should allow for a wider accumulation of productive capital in the future like infrastructures. Otherwise, we treat uh, uh, consumption and investment in the same way, but one thing is current expenditure by the state, another thing is building up an appropriate infrastructure for the future of our children. Prime Minister, taking away from the old in order to give to the young, that's a tricky electoral test. 
Well, it's necessary for the young that we have sustainable economies. Uh, I mean, if we just keep borrowing, we are basically stealing from, from future generations. So it's very clear that we have to have sustainable welfare systems in, in all our welfare systems. I wanted to return to this, uh, this uh, discussion that um, the British Prime Minister has, uh, has started yesterday uh, so clearly. I mean, there has been a lot of reaction to that. And I want to say two things. First of all, it's a perfectly legitimate discussion that is being raised. I think this is a discussion that's been going on in the UK for years, and it's a perfectly legitimate discussion. We might not uh, in Denmark agree on the path, and we have chosen a different path, but it's a legitimate discussion. Second of all, I think there is questions to be asked, of course, in terms of how we run Europe, and we should keep asking those questions. Part of the wake-up call that I was referring to before is that every morning we need to wake up and ask, are we spending public money in the right way? Are we spending this corner or this euro in the right way? And that goes for member states where we are turning every every corner to actually spend it the right way. And of course, the same should go for in, the, in Europe. And this is a discussion we have right now when we're discussing the budget. We'll all meet very soon and looking forward to, dis to discuss our budget. And part of that discussion is that we have to show very clear uh, resolve in terms of spending our money in the best way possible. And this is something we should all be interested in. If we're doing it at the member state level, of course we should be doing, at, doing that at the European level as well. Thank you very much. Now, you know as editor of the Financial Times, I do care about precision. So just to ask each one of you, do you believe that the changes which are going to take place and which will be agreed to secure the Eurozone, those changes will require a treaty change? <laughs> no. Uh, not no. Possibly treaty change in the future. Thank you very much. No, we've shown that we can uh, we can do so much without treaty changes. The last two years have shown us that. So no, I don't think so. Not in the immediate future, but I do believe that we, in the longer term, will need to move to uh, changes which will require uh, treaty changes on the exact type of membership countries have with the eurozone. So in the medium term, I believe a treaty change is unavoidable. In the immediate term, not. Treaty changes, yeah. Not in the, not in the yeah, immediate future. I think now okay. uh, a treaty change would trigger referenda and all this. So in the, in the immediate future, we should not talk or discuss treaty changes. But I do believe that uh, to deal with some of the fundamental design flaws in the Eurozone, we, in the medium term, need a treaty change. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's two no's <laughs> and one or two possibles. So the billion euro question is, how does Mr. Cameron hold a referendum on an agreement where there hasn't been a change in the treaty. I just put that out there. Well, th th this was on the Eurozone. And you could still have, in, in my view, in terms of repatriation of powers, treaty changes at the level of the 27 on the running of, on the, running of the, the European Union. Right. Do you believe that that will be the case? <laughs> what exactly? Because uh, uh, it will be the case that uh, a treaty change is needed not for the Eurozone, but more broadly. For the relationship between the outs and the ins. Uh, no, but let me say one thing about David Cameron's speech. One positive thing. Uh, it is important that whenever the British people, or any people for that matter, are asked the, the question in a referendum about the EU, that the question be the full question, namely, do they wish to continue to be members of the EU or not? This is also the only way that each of our countries can make a choice for its own without conditioning too much the others, without hijacking the others. So I believe that when the moment comes, the UK people uh, will say yes, because put as it is that question if they say no, they would have to get out of the single market, which I believe they will not wish to do. And at any rate, it will be a clear-cut question, rather than hanging on and paralyzing others. In, in, respect, in respect of the Eurozone, um, in the context of greater integration and greater, um, greater um, banking union and so on, 
I do see, uh, I do see the possibility of um, a treaty requirement further up the road. Let me say this in respect of the speech yesterday. Five years is an eternity in politics. It's an eternity. What you need now is clarity, decisiveness, and a horizon. And the Europe, given its, given its uh, current period of relative calmness, now has an opportunity to move on here and make the decisions that we've spoken about, to make the changes that will impact on the economies of Europe and the job prospects for millions of people, which is essentially what politics is about here. And we need to have our own perspective inside the EU, but also where we're going to stand in a global sense in the coming years, given the enormous populations in the Far East, the need for food security, changes arising from right. climate change, water, and so on. But, but just to be clear, you agree with Prime Minister Monti that in the end, the, refer the referendum question has to be in or out? Well, that's a question for the British government. Okay. Absolutely. I think it would be premature to have this discussion now. We need to know what the, what the Brits actually want in this discussion, and we need to, to find out over the, the next, uh, okay. next years, uh, months. Well, uh, I agree with Ender. I think it is up to the British government to decide what the question exactly will be which it will put before the people and uh, on basis of what outcome of what type of discussion they want. So we have to, to see okay. what happens. All right. I think we've chased that rabbit. <laughs> uh, next question from the floor. It must be one. I can't see anybody. Uh, gentlemen, a uh, lady there, yes. Hi, it's, it's Amy Kellogg from Fox again. This is um, a question for Prime Minister Monti and for the Taoiseach. The U.S. now needs to make some serious budget cuts in the coming months to avoid the fiscal, fiscal cliff. And both of you have just gone through the process of making budget cuts in your own countries. And I'm wondering if you can share any lessons learned or tips for the United States as it starts to make its own budget cuts. Thank you. Right, tips for the Congress. I'm sure they're waiting with bated breath. Yes, I would uh, venture to say that uh, Congress uh, should study the case of Italy in the last year, because essentially it was a cross-partisan effort. A special strange coalition was put up uh, of uh, three parties uh, uh, making up 85% of parliament, which in the past uh, barely talked with each other unless to exchange invectives. And uh, uh, they were brought to make a cross-partisan, an, an all-partisan agreement uh, on a budget containment uh, which uh, brings uh, to zero this year <coughs> the budget deficit in structural terms. So I always thought that uh, the attempt made one or two years ago in, uh, the, in the US of a super committee was a laudable bipartisan effort, which had less success though than this strange attempt pursued uh, in Italy. And uh, this, to me, simply means that in order for modern democracies to overcome difficult, to take difficult uh, decisions on structural factors, probably we do need uh, grand coalitions or broader than normally efforts. Thank you. And the, uh, Tisic has the last word on advice to the Congress, Republicans and Democrats, and maybe even something special for the White House. <laughs> well, I propose to bring a, a bowl of shamrock to uh, the President in, um, in March on St. Patrick's Day. Um, I would say this. We've had to make very painful decisions here, reducing public pay, reducing the size and cost of the public sector, increasing pension ages, changing the regulations governing wage setting mechanisms, changing the structures in the areas like health and the way government does its business. I think the first thing you need is a plan and a strategy that's clear and that can be set out so that people can understand that you have an objective in mind. Our objective is to get our deficit below 3% by 2015, and we're headed on track for that. We've now instituted a new negotiation with the trades unions 
to take a further billion in current spending, um, uh, in pay, overtime allowances, uh, all of these premium payments, agency workers and so on, uh, over the next three years. This is another painful challenge, uh, and yet the objective and the strategy is clear. Now, the um, Congress and the U.S. government operate differently than, than governments here. But I think it's very, it's very important. The first thing that should be laid out is, what do you want over the period of government? What is the strategy within that time to achieve that? If there's a constant expl explanation to people as to how you intend to get there and what that's actually going to bring about. Just, we're not there yet. Obviously, in a fragile economy, we need the conclusion of European support. Um, but in that sense, the United States, as such, such a huge country with such enormous internal potential, I believe that if Republicans and Democrats under the, under the um, return administration of President Obama, I believe they will deal with this. And I think the United States, with respect to them, yeah. also need to look at their global position because obviously they have an impact on, yeah. on, the, on the world economies yeah. and therefore on ours. Good. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm uh, sorry we're going to have to draw this to a close. I was hoping that the Irish Prime Minister would say, send that message saying, if you only could get your act together and cure these problems, it would be so much better for the Europe and the world. But you're far too much of a diplomat to say that. Um, I expect they will. Uh, he, he does expect they will. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we can't take more questions. It's been a fascinating session. Please join me in thanking the Prime Ministers.